Everybody, welcome back to Five Dirty Bikers Podcast. We're brought to you by Memphis Shades and Wild Ass Seats. Today we got a special guest, uh, kind of a big one here, uh, manager of content production, actually, at JMP Cycles. We have Patrick Garvin here. Thank you very much for joining us this week. Oh, thanks for having me. This is awesome. Presented by Memphis Shades, the clear choice for custom windshields and bearings for your motorcycle. And wild ass seats, stay in the saddle longer and in total comfort no matter your butt or budget. So Patrick, a lot of people probably know who you are. If they've seen you, you've done a lot of video content. I know I've seen a lot of it on YouTube and it's been very helpful for me trying to do installs and stuff like that. So uh, great work on the production of everything you guys do over there. Now, can you kind of walk us through, like, do you have your own production, like, film crew for how you guys do your content and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, this kind of normally surprises people. It's literally me and one other person. Yeah. Um, so, like, it's just, uh, we, we work with, so just a little a little bit wider scope. So we technically work for Komodo. So Komodo mm-hmm. owns JMP Cycles and Revzilla and Cycle Gear and actually that forever. So that was big for us uh, a few years ago, and that happened because Revzilla was so big in the video space, and that you know it, it was just the two of us here. But having the production staff on their end of it in Philadelphia help us with stuff is just organizational stuff, and you know sharpening things up that helps a bunch. But all of the, like work, work is just it's me, and then I have a, a cameraman, the like, same guy that shoots it, edits it, um, uh-huh. my buddy Steve Luke, which is is really important. Like you mentioned, we do a lot of technical videos. And so it helps to have somebody who understands motorcycles, Harleys, and the work that's being done to edit it. Because you know, you know, you can imagine how hard it would be if the person was a good editor but completely foreign to motors, didn't know what a clutch plate was, or mm-hmm. you know what I mean. It would be very difficult. So he is, you know, uh, really key to our program here. And we hired him in like 2018, and it was great. We we're kind of interviewing people and. He had a, a chopped up Sportster and stuff, and I was like, "Hey, man, uh, I'm I'm gonna go to EDR." It was no, it was two, yeah, 2019. I'm like, "Do you want to ride to Mexico?" And he was like, "Yeah." I was like, "That's the guy. Hire him." Like, <laughs> anybody, <laughs> anybody wants to ride to Mexico with me it is great. So, yeah, it's a two man operation here. Very That's cool. Impressive. Yeah, that is. I'm gonna say that you've got me fucked up in my garage more than once. <laughs> over my head i can do this <laughs> well i tell everybody like if, if i can do it you can do it like it's i'm i'm definitely no brain surgeon well your your milwaukee cam install i think between tony and i there's at least a thousand views between the two of us on how to do that cam install exactly and it, and it came in handy because he did his first and then i drove my bike down to kentucky and we did mine both in his garage on our gra- on a garage floor yeah. with just the scissor lift and uh so, you know, we proved that that uh, with with your video and a couple of of uh, uh, tools, you can you can do that in your garage without really uh, any any mechanical uh, know how whatsoever. Yeah, because, I mean, that, that was your, you guys have M8s or twin cams? M8s. M8s. That's even easier then. Um, the twin cam is just slightly more difficult, but that's one thing we actually try to do is I, I always have. I mean basically 100% of the time garage mechanic in mind. So yeah. there are special tools that you need. Like, so for that, you know, you need the bearing uh, yeah. puller yeah. installer, right? Which yep. c- kind of sucks if you're just the, the dude in his garage, cause you're probably only going to use that one or two times, but if you got a buddy yeah. that needs it, that's great. But if you notice, I, I don't use a lot of, I mean, I'm always using hand tools, you know yeah. what I mean? Just stuff in a toolbox. Like I could speed things up with a lot of air tools or, impact something like that i generally try to keep it to kind of basic tools even though it makes it a little tougher on me um obviously we use a lift but we always have the garage mechanic in mind when we're doing this just you know because we know that that's our target you know we want people to buy those parts from from us at gmp well if you're gonna buy a cam you want to be able to put it in i don't want to send you to the dealer to you know necessarily do it and i don't have any formal training i didn't go to any school anything like that this is all from like just spinner wrenches for a long time 
Um, and just I, I'm self-taught and I hope people that watch my stuff is, are also going to be self-taught. It's like, I'm not really, I'm joking, but I'm not when I say, if I could do it, you can do it. <laughs> well, I think that's, I think that's great information because I, I think your videos are s of such good quality from a, from a technical aspect that you, you convey that you have formal training, right? But you don't, you don't put the information out there that the average person can't consume it. What I, what I loved about the cam video, and this is where it kind of tricks you, right? Is that you take this entire install and you condense it down to like a 20, a 24 to 27 minute video. Mm -hmm. So it's very consumable too. So you can watch it a bunch of times and, and you're teaching yourself through that process. And then I, I I'm like, Tony, like I got done. I'm like, fuck, I could do this. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the attitude that we were, <laughs> were hoping for. And I mean, I, I, you know, a little more background way back, way back in the day, I had a shop and I actually uh, got hooked with a buddy of mine, got a contract to do installs for JMP at Sturgis. And for, for a number of years, we did the installs at Sturgis and Daytona. And um, that's a great way to get your hands on a lot of bikes in a short time. So sure. doing all of those installs, have my own shop. And then I started drag racing, no bar street bikes with turbo and nitrous and all kinds of stuff like that. And started building motors and then yeah but it, i was all just basically self-taught um so again that feeds into the video and like we try to there are certain things that i know somebody is going to want to see because i went through it my first or second time like oh this part really sucks you really need to see this so we try not to have a wide shot where we know somebody's going to want to see sometimes it's all the way down to like, you really need to get the wrench on. And I'll even say like, put it on like this in this position. Otherwise you're going to screw yourself when you try to turn something. We try to get to that level because that's the stuff I went through putting the stuff on, you know, like I broke a lot of shit before I was putting it on. <laughs> <off> right. <laughs> well, it always looks easy. You know, you watch it on the video and you're like, oh right. man, that's a fucking piece of cake. And then you start doing it, especially like you're talking about that, that cam or the, uh, the cam bearing when that thing breaks loose i mean i thought i fucked everything up i was I like oh my god up. yeah i think you broke the inside of the case yeah exactly yeah. The, the big pop <laughs> i got and i was like oh jesus i didn't yeah. <laughs> but no you guys do a great job over there man and i'll tell you what that fxr video you just put out your fxr is just phenomenal that was uh so that was i think this is the only time we've done this that's my bike um most of the time it's not my bike it's uh most of the time, JMP own bikes or every now and then, like, I'll actually borrow, like, I just borrowed a bike from the city of Sturgis to do some stuff with. We need a bike. But um, that was mine. Yeah, that's uh, my bike from way back when. And uh, unlike me, I left that thing insanely, like, basically almost 100% bone stock for a long, long time. And just rode it until that, you know, that 80-inch motor, eventually they just kind of, like, lay over and die. And... Yeah, then I put a not well now it has a twin cam one twenty four in it. So yeah. yeah, that was I, I don't always that's the other thing. With our builds, I don't always get to build them in like, you know, the way I would build a bike necessarily. Obviously my fingerprints are all over it, but a lot of times the builds are driven by something we want to focus on or vendors we're partnering with, or if it's a giveaway bike, I build it a certain way. Um, it's not very often that it's just like 100%. This is what I want to do with the motorcycle. And I had that one kind of rolling around in my head. I really love resto mod cars, you know, like a, like a 68 C 10 with like an LS turbo motor underneath with good brakes, something like that. All patina. That's kind of what I had in my head. I was like, I just want to make this like a resto mod looking build with a big badass motor in it and all the good stuff underneath. I left stock wheels on it. The stock cast wheels are still on it. I didn't want to do a super duper inverted front end uh, still has a 39 millimeter front end. It has race tech internals, but I wanted it to look the part, but be, you know, as badass as it could otherwise. Well, that paint job is badass too. Tony's got you all FXR fucked up, doesn't he? Hey, dude, I was on <laughs> Facebook marketplace after that video. I was like, God damn it. I'm, I need an FXR. See, that's what I'm, I'm so trying to figure out what I want to do. I, I, uh, I started um, as a passenger on a 85 FXR, um, FXRT, and mm. I got my hands on one. Um, a bar, a, I, I shouldn't say a barn find. Even it was in a in a storage shed find, uh, virtually unmolested. Two owners, and I'm the third owner of a bike, and it's got thirty five thousand original miles on it, and it's virtually untouched, other than they put a trailer hitch on it. That's it. The rest of it is all just stock, stock exhaust, 
stock yeah. everything. And so I was able to pick one up stock paint job. So I have an FXR 85 FXRT sitting in my garage that I just have sat in my garage for the last year and stared at and tried to figure out what I want to do. I, I I'm with you. I like the resto mod, but I'm trying to figure out if I just, I, I think I want to, I think I just want to get it running enough and just run it until the, till the motor blows up and then, then, then resto mod it. But yeah, I always tell people, you know, I, I do, I love working on motorcycles, but you know what I like a lot more than working on motorcycles, riding them, riding, riding motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. So, so you got to Yeah. Go ride it. Yeah. So, yeah. Patrick, let's go back a little further. You were talking about back in the day earlier. Uh, give us your full motorcycle history. Where, when did it start for you and, you know, kind of where it ended up now? I was a little, like, uh, late to the game as far as motorcycles for, as a lot, you know, kind of a, a lot of people start when they're kids. I didn't, my dad owned a construction company and I worked for his construction company. And uh, there's a guy named Randy Stowe that worked for my dad. And Randy grew up, him and his brothers all had Harleys. And he was, uh, you know, he was older than me. And he had a 60, 62 panhead. And uh, he used to ride it to work every day. And it wasn't a stock panhead. It had like apes on it. It was black. And uh, jockey shift, foot clutch. It was bitching. And he used to ride it to work every day. And I finally was like, man, that bike's good. Like, I would talk to him, talk to him. So I was probably 21, 22. And... Uh, I was not mechanically inclined. I played sports in high school. I didn't even change oil in my own car. Yeah. Uh, and so, I, he, he, you know, being around him, that panhead, I eventually went out and bought an Ironhead. I think everybody, does everybody own a Harley? I think at one time has owned an Ironhead, or you probably should have if you really, really want to be a mechanic. So, like, I got an <laughs> Ironhead Sportster, and uh, I had it for not very long. And I bought a Evo Sportster in a, the 883. And that was my first, that was my first foray into like working on bikes. I, it wasn't fast enough. And a bunch of dudes in town, I grew up in a place in Davenport, Iowa, in a place called the Quad Cities, uh, Iowa and Illinois border there. And man, like everybody, every mid 20 year old had an 80 horsepower Evo Sportster. And so mine was too slow. And that was at the time when you could go to Harley and that was when the X1 duels were still around. And so you could go buy a set of thunderstorm heads for like 500 bucks for the set brand new from the dealer a set of pistons to match it throw some andrews like in four cams in it a thunder header and a carb and have like an 80 horsepower sportster and so that's what i did i just like bought a manual and took the top end off of it and i learned really quickly about adjusting waiting for push rod or waiting for lifters to bleed down because no. if you don't <laughs> if you don't use adjustable push rods and you put your solid push rods in there you don't wait for the lifters to bleed down you will bend a push rod uh, so uh, I went to a mechanic buddy of mine. He he schooled me up on that, and that was kind of like what got me off into motorcycles. And after a while, I like me and my dad built another another Sportster, a 1250 with power titanium H beam rods and super hot <clears> rod. <throat> that wasn't fast enough, so I went out and bought a used but it was it was a 2001 in 2001 had about 500 miles on it zx12 kawasaki zx12 r which was the competitor of the hayabusa i went out and bought that and then because i wanted to drag race and i started no bar drag racing and that took me down a lot of paths i had a uh 120 shot of nitrous on that bike for a long time until it broke <laughs> god and, damn yeah and then i <laughs> i built a, a turbo how much, ZX how much nitrous 120 shot the bike god made damn. 318 on the spray Holy uh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, from there, I, I played around some turbo boosts and a turbo ZX-10, a nitrous ZX-10, a nitrous ZX-14, and uh, always had like Harleys and sport bikes just because I, I used to drag race a ton. All, all like no bar street bike drag racing stuff. Uh, so from there, that's when I kind of opened up my shop. I had a dyno, did a lot of dyno stuff, a lot of dyno tuning um mostly harleys i mean i had a few sport bike guys that came to me you know the race guys but it was mostly harley stuff and i always had a harley around and then um jmp offered me a job that kind of worked out because my dad sold his construction company and uh actually went back to school and so i moved from me and my wife and my uh little boy moved from davenport iowa up to jmp uh, and in 2008 
And then um, I bought my Dyna, I think, around that time, too. I had a twin cam Dyna who I just recently sold a couple years ago. Man, I love that bike. I ended up putting a stroker motor in it. I, I tend to just just jam giant engines and everything, uh, <laughs> uh, which is kind of my favorite thing to do. So I put a stroker motor in that. And then I started as like in the – actually, everybody out of, remembers the big catalogs at JMP. I started as a product merchant and had catalog sections. You know, I, I you know, I had engines and uh, drive line and uh, intake and exhaust. And so I did that. And then I, I had a, through that time leading up, I was doing the install stuff with my buddy. You know, he got the contract with JMP. So while I had my shop, I would take time off to come do the installs because it was good money until I got the job at JMP. And that's kind of how I, you know, met the people I needed to meet at JMP. And, uh, Jill Parham actually hired me. Uh, you know, I worked for John, John and Jill for you know a long time, until up until uh, 2015, when the company was bought by LDI slash Tucker, and it moved the headquarters to Dallas. And I did not want them. I'm not a Dallas type of dude. I'm a I'm not. a small town type of guy. <laughs> uh, I get you. And so at the time, you know, it kind of it was known in the industry that JMP was moving down there. And uh, a guy that I'd worked with with Mag Group, you know, JMP was own was part of Mag Group, who owned Vance and Hines and Performance Machine and Roland Sands and Kiriak, and that was all owned by Mag Group. And so I had some Mag Group connections, and uh, Paul Langley, who ran Vance and Hines for a while and ran SNS, he had went to SNS just just a few months before, and he hired a guy named David Zemla, David Zemla to run the marketing department, who was also a mag guy from Formic Machine. We know, we know, we, we know, know Dave David yep. well, yeah. yeah. So Zemla reached out to me and was like, hey, are you going to Dallas? And I was like, nope. <laughs> and so, <laughs> uh, he brought That's me, a hard no. Yeah, he brought me to SNS, which was great. And I spent about two years at SNS. And uh, so Zach Parham, you know, the son of the founder of JMP, him and I are friends, and we had stayed in contact. Um, the whole time and eventually it came back and he's like hey do you want to come back to jmp and i, I really really miss jmp although i have i mean I, my time at sns was phenomenal it was a great people great company i really really enjoyed that but um i was able to come back and i said well my moment is at dallas Zach. and he goes you can go anywhere you want and so i i when i i used to run events part of my time at jmp i ran all of all of the events which was one of my favorite jobs at jmp was running events it was and, but but I used to be out here in Sturgis for about a month a month at a time because I don't know if you're familiar with the Sturgis lot uh, at, of JMP Cycles. It's a city block in between Maine and Lazelle. Mm -hmm. Well, it used to be the store wasn't open year round, and we would rent it out to a car lot, and so we would have to come in weeks in advance, get everything out of here, put up all the racking and everything, bring in semi loads of product, hang every single thing up, just to open for business for 14 days. So me and four other guys did that. And so I was here for about a month every year. So I knew I liked it out here. And so I said, I want to go to Sturgis. And he's like, what? And I was like, yeah, send me to Sturgis. And we have this building out back. So it worked out great. You heard me talk about, you know, Steve, we, we hired Steve, my video guy. And uh, the store's open year round now. It worked out great. My wife came out. She got a great job. My wife's the um, executive director of Deadwood and Lead Economic Development. And so, yeah, it, it worked out wonderfully. And so I ended up here back making videos again and then like we mentioned before Camp komodo came into the scene and that just helped steve and i even more because repzilla is such a juggernaut on the video side of things mm -hmm. that just really helped us polish up our program it gave us more tools to work with and i mean we just you know really put the put the hammer down as far as making videos we started you know now we do more bike builds we do a couple of them a year between two and three a year along with our you know product videos along with the what we call our weekend, weekend wrenching videos so that was kind of like, that's the fast track. But what came out of that was um, I started hooligan racing in at SNS, kind of like in the early heydays of hooligan racing when it was just on the West Coast. And there was a guy by the name of Hunter Clee who works at SNS, who came from Vance and Hines, who was, I say Hunter built the first hooligan bike back in the day at Costa Mesa. And so he got me into hooligan racing. We started traveling and doing that. So I kind of got a taste of the dirt. Then when I moved out here, a lot of people don't realize out here in the Black Hills, we have over 3,000 miles of public trail uh, in the Black Hills National Forest. So for Father's Day, my wife bought me a $500 dirt bike for our first year here. And then that was the, you know, the, 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 the taste, you know, I needed. And then I've just been basically riding dirt like nonstop 
since I've been here. So shit. And yeah. it because Ryan's right above you in North Dakota. Mm-hmm. Who's that? Ryan. Yeah, I live in I am. I am I yeah. live in Grand Forks. Oh, so I didn't I know live. that. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I go out to out your way a couple times a year and camp and ride out there and that kind of stuff. And Dave and I or Percy, we're we're gonna head out to Sturgis this year. It'll be our first time and we're going to um we're working with uh andy and greg at the iron horse in nice and we're going to be staying there and then broadcasting the podcast from there and hopefully that's we a, get some of these other guys out 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 here with us so and, and having having, we? having coffee we're, we're going to have some fuck coffee you and your coffee <laughs> fuck you and your coffee <laughs> <laughs> ride awesome, to coffee man. yeah yeah so yeah that's the the one in in whitewood i think that's the the what you're talking about yeah so yeah but yeah mean, that's you love it here i can't believe this whole story you just told about all the go fast stuff and you are still alive i mean <laughs> that 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 is that's against all odds already you know i didn't i, I i've done a pretty good job of staying on the top of my motorcycle uh with the exception of the last few d- years in the dirt and uh in hooligan racing yeah i've definitely probably in the last eight years i've fallen off a motorcycle way more than the previous years but racing you know sportsters on a flat track and then hurling yourself you know through the woods in a dirt bike you'll eventually fall off i got ran over in 2000 19 in las vegas in a hooligan race that was pretty that was pretty sucky yeah i was gonna um, say that that'll run your fucking day yeah it? i yeah. still i have the helmet somewhere it might be, uh <clears throat> has it has a tire mark oh nice oh. Oh. Have you ever- what, wait a minute for the record what helmet what kind of helmet is it, it it's a it's a lane splitter it's a built well lane splitter yeah all right everybody Ooh. go buy you a lane splitter <laughs> <laughs> you know they work that's yeah. the thing about helmets like everybody wants to talk about how much money they spend on a helmet but how do you know they really work until you've gone down on one yeah, it's a rough way to figure it out, but you will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there's there's, there's a testimony that. right there. Yeah, I can't. So, Patrick, have you ever done uh, Flat Out Friday at, at Mama Tried? Many times. Many have times, you? yeah. Yeah, I got I, those guys. I've, I've been going to – I was at – I with the. I haven't gone to – I didn't go to the last one. Jeremy and Warren and Scott and those yep. guys are great. I started going to Mama Tried at the second one. Okay. Uh, way back in the old warehouse – uh, the old white walled warehouse before yep. it moved to the other warehouse. But yep. um, I, I, I was at the first flat out Friday at, at the Panther. Didn't I actually built the bike that raced there, but I didn't race it. And then I raced like, I don't know, maybe four in a row after that. Um, yeah. I thought, man, I was the last one I raced was right before COVID and I was ticked off because it was the best I'd ever done there. Um, and I screwed up in a heat race and a guy fell in front of me, and instead of cutting the inside, it cut to the outside. Somebody went underneath me, and I should have won a heat race, and I didn't, so I was ticked mm-hmm. off about that. Uh, I did some indoor racing in Daytona during that same time where I lost a lot of skin. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, like, I'm kind of an idiot. I still wear, like, I mean, I wear motocross boots and knee braces and stuff, but I still wear just, like, dickies and a long sleeve shirt. Okay. Uh, and so I don't know how familiar you are with concrete racing. Yep. But they, they, so they spray, you know, Dr. Pepper syrup on yep. the surface. Yep. So it gets yep. very, very tacky. Yep. And then the rubber gets laid down on top of it. So in the groove is insanely sticky. You can tell it's not. Right. Um, <laughs> so I was coming through a corner and, it, man, it was a wild race. Like I said, it was in Daytona a few years ago. It was an indoor race. And it was, it was just carnage everywhere. I think it was, they were running like 15 lap races, which is kind of long for those indoor races. And I think we were down to like the final four or five laps. I think I was in fifth place or something. And I had the, you can lean the bike way, way, way over. And so I leaned the bike over and it hit on the primary, the, the derby cover hit. And when it did, it just lifted the bike up. And so when that solid surface is on that smooth concrete, I don't care if there's Dr. Pepper, it's like on ice. Yeah. And so the bike yeah. just, just left away from me. Sure. Well, when I hit the ground, I could literally hear it like, <laughs> and like oh. my shirt was like rolled, like rolled up, you know, oh. just so like I have a picture somewhere of me holding my shirt up. And so it's like my, from my waist, like all the way up into my armpit is just like oh. peeled skin. Oh. Like, it's gotta be terrible. <laughs> it, was, it was really bad. 
Uh, <laughs> well, and not to mention in your armpit on top of it. I cannot yeah. imagine. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, so the skin stayed. And it was like I literally heard the squealing of my skin across the – that was another good one. But, yeah, Flat Out Friday – uh, it's a good time. It's a good time if you're racing. Good time if you're watching. I highly recommend. Yeah, I, I I've been to the last uh, three Mama Tried events, and uh, I I love it. I love it out there. That uh, Flat Out Friday racing. It's so much fun, and and the boonie bikes, and just all of the oh, stuff yeah. that they do out there. And then the event is such a cool, chill event. Um, and and you go a couple times, and you start to recognize people and know people, and have great conversations. And I always talk to the SNS guys every time we're out there. Uh, we know them pretty. You know, we know them a little bit um, from just the podcast and having um, some relationships with them, and and Tyler from Lowbrow, and and mm-hmm. so yeah, just just really solid people, and obviously being uh, Upper Midwest, right? So it's a, yeah. it's very indicative of what you'd expect from Upper Midwest. You know, everybody's pretty chill, and and uh, this year I got an opportunity to uh, um, Jared Weems, who built our charity chopper. Um, he was out there showing his bike. And so we got a, um, some sort of wicked mansion downtown. And, uh, so we all got there at night. We wake up in the morning. I swear to God, there was 18 people in this mansion, just sleeping mm-hmm. on floors and couches and tabletops That's and kitchen very counters. Mama tried of you. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> we went, we went balls deep at mama tried this year. So oh my dude. God. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't ever let that slip out. (laughs) When your balls deep, it doesn't slip out, Tony. Ryan, Ryan, what's the name of the races where it's all gimmicky? Everybody dresses up. uh, Well, it's the last race they usually do. um, The the last race of of Flat Out Friday. I don't remember if they have a name for it or not. Yeah, uh, shoot, it's slipping my mind. They have a name for it, but yeah, yeah, they they, they do. Yeah. Tony, yeah. this is a missed opportunity if you don't jump on this because you could totally be like a rolling glory hole. Oh you yeah, could. <laughs> I mean it would be fantastic. <laughs> yeah, so you saw the the porta potty one. The guy was yeah. wearing khaki pants and it really looked right. like he was you naked could, from the waist. You could down. do a giant poster board of a glory hole and put it on a boonie <laughs> yeah. bike and just go around the track. Yep. <laughs> Inappropriate I could spend class. all year making that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The inappropriate class. Yeah, that's what it's called. It's a, that's the name is the inappropriate class. Yeah. So this is super old school Flat Out Friday. The first Flat Out Friday, the inappropriate class. Man, the guy's name, his real name is slipping my mind. He's a, he's a Wisconsin guy. He's a flat tracker. But so they had the inappropriate class out there with choppers and stuff. And it wasn't as big as it is now. There was a guy there and he was dressed like Prince. Vel- velvet purple he, he little like, purple bastard well here's the thing he was he <laughs> didn't break character in the pits he had this long purple coat on and a wig and sunglasses and then when you go out there he had like a honda 500 but it had that wind jammer fairing like yeah. prince had yeah. the purple ring and he was wearing a, a black leather coat and he had a white dove like stapled to his <laughs> shoulder <laughs> Nice. Yeah, and he had the wig on the helmet, and then he had a white guitar on the sissy bar. But the fun part was he was insanely fast. He was just <laughs> rattling around there. It was just, yeah, Prince was my favorite part of the first spot. He was the, he was like the first guy to really kick off the inappropriate class. They had they had a guy uh, not last year, but the the one that was in December. So it was like the COVID year. Mama tried. So it was like in twenty twenty in December. I was there. For and that, yeah, for the the boater cycle. And did you oh, see yeah. when? Yeah, when he when he won, he didn't break character either. So he was like, they came up on my port side when yeah. they interviewed him at the end. <laughs> it was so fucking great. He was just going on and on about all these boat terms. And yeah, it was it was it so, was absolutely phenomenal. Part of the genius is that is Milwaukee. People don't really if you haven't been to Milwaukee, you don't really yeah. understand the genius of Milwaukee. But that scene fits so well in Milwaukee yep. and everything that's downtown in Milwaukee. It's just perfect. I mean, Milwaukee yep. is you know, every house that's downtown could be a bar. I yep. mean, it's just like a house with a ham sign over the top of it. And exactly. you go in and there's like a 14 foot bar with 35 people in there. Yeah. So if you're, yeah. if you're blue collar and you want to find your place where you fit, go to mama tried because it's just all blue collar people. I mean, that's this, the whole event is just, it just reeks of, of that kind of blue collar vibe. And it, yeah, like I said, it's my people. I, I love it there. I, nope. It's, it's so much up, fun. When you wake up in a house full of 18 people and you're hungover, yeah. go to go to Silverman's. Get yeah. yourself to Silverman's. Have you been to Silverman's? I, I haven't I haven't been there. Oh, I just man. I just one of the guys from uh, the Easy Company, he walks he walks into the kitchen and we we had made coffee so everybody that, that was awake that could smell coffee was coming into this kitchen and he's like 
anybody seen my clothes? And one of the guys like, yeah, he's like, it's in a bar in downtown. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, why did I take off my clothes? They're like, we asked you the same thing. He goes, dude, Good those are him. like $400 overalls. I left downtown <laughs> in the bar. And they're like, yeah, we don't know why you took them off either, but you did. Solomon's Bloody Mary. It's, it's like 60 bucks. Uh, it's a pitcher. <clears throat> it comes with a fried chicken in it. Yeah. I think three or four hamburgers, a couple of wow. like sausage and cheese hors d'oeuvres in it, Hell a yeah. basket of fries, and a pitcher of Miller Lite. Whew. And a stent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And a heart yeah. stent. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, and a roll of toilet paper. Yeah. Gee yeah. <laughs> whiz. Oh. So, Patrick, I'll tell you, everybody wants to know, dude, recommendations. Mm-hmm. Stage one, stage two. Where are you? I mean, it, uh, so what kind of bike are we talking about? Like a bagger? Well, most or, uh, of our, most of the people are looking at the M8s. M8 stuff. So, I mean, everybody honestly is always worried about warranty stuff. And I would say, don't worry about that. Uh, <laughs> That's what I say. <laughs> I'm not worried fuck, about fuck it. Fuck a warranty. <laughs> um, I mean, on the intake side of things, there are so many good intakes uh, out there now. I mean, there's the, I mean, obviously, I'm really partial to SNS stuff. But their stealth line is huge. Um, Ness honestly kind of pioneered the way with the big sucker years and years ago. I have and one so of those. They're awesome. Everybody just kind of makes a version of that with the round air cleaner. Mm. The elbow air cleaners do work, um, but you really to really I mean for them to work better than let's say a like a stealth or a round style air cleaner, you need a really big engine. So it's just aesthetics at that point. But if you stay with um, the Ness stuff or the SNS stuff. The, the Vance and Hines stuff works, but where, where you really kind of separate what, what I like is in construction. So a lot of the air cleaners have like a lot of, a lot of moving pieces, right? You have a backing plate and spacers that fall out and then you have to have, you bolt the velocity stack in there and then put the thing on. You have to have spacers to put the outside cover on. The one thing I like about the Nest stuff and the SNS stuff is it's basically that all that stuff is kind of built in together and the breathers in is inside the unit right like so it's cast into it so there's yeah. not a lot of like the less parts the better especially with intake um mm-hmm. so i like the ones that are simpler so i kind of like lean to the nest stuff and i lean to the sns stuff because it's it's you know there, there's less parts there but basically you know any of the known names of intake they all work pretty well as long as you have a washable reusable uh, filter where it's going to get weird when you start using really, really small intakes, right? Like, you know, the chopperific looking stuff with the velocity stacks and that, you're going to lose a lot of rideability there. Like the, your mid range is going to suffer. Your low end is going to suffer. It's going to cough. It's going to sputter. Fuel injected bikes is a little bit better, but you really need to have like an actual filter of some sort on the intake side. On the exhaust, I mean. There's the dicey one there. Yeah. Here's the thing with M8s that where, where it gets a little different is – so when I was at SNS, that was when the M8s came out, and we had two of the first ones. And I can tell you, if you're going to run a stock header, I don't really care what you put put behind it. It doesn't matter. Um, because that that big cat is in there, um, you can take the mufflers off. It pretty much sounds the same. works the same. Yeah. Uh, so you really need to put some headers on that thing and something with a crossover. A crossover, I mean, Reinhardt back in the day did an amazing job of, of marketing – true duels and the reality is a true dual setup where one pipe is separate from the other isn't as good especially in the middle of the of the power range than something with a crossover you know vance and hines crossover is very apparent there with the big x and i think reinhardt might do with an x in it sns does like a hydro formed one in the back so it looks like two separate pipes but it's actually you need that crossover in there it's very very helpful but again even with the m8s i would say with the intake and exhaust and a tune you bring, you're still going to be lucky if you see seven, eight horsepower out of the thing. Whereas like the old twin cam days where you would do an intake and exhaust, tune that thing up, you're probably going to get 12 or 15 horsepower. The M8s don't respond until they get a cam. And then that's where the M8s vastly outperform the twin cams, right? You can do a drop in SNS 465 cam and be pushing 100 horse at the tire with, you know, with, with an intake and exhaust and a tune. Before, if you had a twin cam, let's say you had an 88-inch twin cam, you need to do a 95-inch kit, some cams, and an intake, and exhaust to hope you come close to that 100 horsepower. Where the M8s really shine is when you start dropping a cam in there. They have a four-valve head, and they're not really taking advantage of it with that stock cam. So as soon as you put a cam in an M8, man, 
it's a completely different motorcycle. So as far as stage one, it's kind of pick your poison with, with what you want with the big companies. It is going to help. Um, but when you really start making bacon is when you switch those cams. And then the other part of this is tune. Um, man, and that's, where, again, where things get di dicey because so many companies are having to stay compliant because of carb regulations and, and, and things like that, which means they're only – they're like the new FP4 is very, very locked down. You're only getting – you're getting a small amount of adjustment there. And they even say they consider it a stage one tuner, and I would say that's definitely the limit. Um, you need something – like I would consider like a power vision or if you really want to go out there and get a thunder max, that's like top of the food chain stuff, but uh, you need something that will allow you to adjust that fuel. I always say, think about it like a graph. So if you your air curve, your stock air curve on your bike goes like this, and then you put an intake and exhaust on. Now that air curve is going like this, but your, your stock fuel curve is still down here. They match the stock intake curve. So you got all, you're missing a bunch of fuel. So you need something to be able to match that new intake curve. And with just stage one stuff, like an FP4 is probably going to be fine. The minute you move past that, you're going to need something that's more capable to tune farther, let, you know, or, or get a map that has more adjustment in it. And that's where I think the DinoJet stuff really shines. And if you really want to go farther, uh, we built that. I don't know if you've seen it. We built a, I built the soft tail, 131 soft tail. Uh, that made 150 horsepower and 150 foot pounds of torque, and I use a Thunder Max for that. So that's it, impressive. Yeah, no, I, I have Tony's, the power Tony's, vision. He's he's going to go buy a Thunder Max next week. Oh, fuck. <laughs> probably. <laughs> I will say the nice thing about the Power Vision stuff. So Power Vision, the, the Power Vision has the screen is really nice. I think, as far as like honestly, the best buy in tuners right now, I think it's a PV3, a Power Vision three. It's I think it's the same price as a fuel pack. It's about 460 bucks, I think. Whereas the the standard power vision is like $770. As yeah, I bought I was lucky, man. I got that thing right before the price increase. Yeah, it's a really, really great unit. Yeah. So it, it can be as good as a Thunder Max because you can throw wide bands on it. That's the difference, right? Like your stock motor is using narrow bands, which means think of sensors based on voltage. They're only good for a couple of so like the stock narrowband sensor is only good basically at idle or just off idle to be able to to get that o2 sensor to sniff to give you a reading to make a change to you have to have wide bands that's why thunder max uses wide bands and that's why you can upgrade to wide bands on the dino jet stuff and then it's basically sky's the limit those things will read anywhere from 10 to 1 to 18 to 1 which is like wildly rich and lean so to really tune and run and use those auto tune features, the, any unit is only good as its sensors. And if you're using stock narrow band sensors, you're only as good as that narrow band sensor. And it's, you know, they call it narrow for a reason because it's got a very small voltage range. It's to very work small. In. Yeah. You were affiliate. Were you affiliated with Fuel Moto for a while? Or yeah, I was. I did. I did some work for Jamie, and man, they feel, that's a great program. And Jamie's a great guy. And let me tell you, they they know their stuff. Um, I still talk to this. Jamie and I still trade notes to this day and talk to each other. And uh, that's a great company, man. Yeah, because I, I bought mine from them. And, you know, obviously great when idea. you do it, you can request maps as you mm -hmm. go. And uh, they seem pretty legit. I mean, the maps very. do. Yeah. Jamie's oh. very legit. And, they man, they spend a lot of time on a dyno. Uh, I mean, all that stuff that, that Jamie has built over the years, that's just years and years and years of working and building bikes and tuning bikes and saving all that stuff. And uh, I know his son, Lucas, is a bigger part of the co company now, too. And uh, I, like I said, I can't say enough good things about those guys. Patrick, what do you think about the FP3 versus the FP4? Because when Tony and I did my uh, cam last summer, so I have, um, I guess I still have the stock head pipes on, but I have a, um, I have slip-ons on the back. I have an air cleaner, and we put a um, SNS 475 mm -hmm. cam kit in. And we called... Um, Vance and Hines and I still have the FP3 and they just sent me a map and it was plug and play and and it it has uh I mean my bike runs like a rape rape dape and I have the uh I have the 107 <laughs> FP4 is or the FP3 is much more adjustable than the FP4 I know that's okay. I could probably somebody's probably gonna get an email um, <laughs> well, I will but, I will save you from the email Patrick because I have an FP4 out in the garage I use as a paperweight 
Well, there you go. <laughs> I mean, so, you can you can read the reviews on the website. Let's yeah, I'll just tell you that. It just um, it, yeah, your FP3 I'm sure is doing good work on that bike. But you say you still have stock head pipe on there with a cat in it? I do now. Yeah. Do you so, love emissions I, compliance? What? I, no, I, I don't. I don't give a shit about emission compliance. It's, <laughs> it's just yeah. No, good, good. Please do, please do. It's it's one of those. I just haven't. You know, I haven't gotten to it. I, I don't know why but I haven't the, gotten listen, to it. Listen, but... Zemla, if you're listening to this podcast, this man needs a set of MA headpipes. Yeah, see? Listen yeah. to that guy. <laughs> uh, you know, just the two the uh, SNS's horn a little bit more. I mean, the one really nice thing about SNS pipes, too, is, you know, behind the chrome heat shields, is everybody just sees the finished product. That's a stainless pipe, man. They use stainless even when you can't see it. So, like, yeah, they're, they're the guys that build the pipes there in lacrosse. Hunter Clee and his team, like it's a re- they're really nice stuff. In fact, you know, obviously you want to run heat shields, but man, the stuff behind the heat shield is even nice. So you know, you, this is uh, we've said this before, but it it, it begs to to uh, to say it again while you're on here. Don't you think the worst job in the motorcycle industry is the guy who makes the stock Harley pipes and the guy who makes the stock <laughs> Harley seats? Right? I mean, that guy's got like the worst job ever because he knows either I'm, that or he gonna, just doesn't give a shit. Right? Yeah, they, they, they like design care. these great seats. And they're like these motherfuckers are just gonna take this seat <laughs> off and they're gonna throw it in the trash when they get this bike home. It's just paperweights, man. That's yeah. what he's designing. Yeah. yeah. All the seats are hey, I got a bunch of stock seats hanging on my wall in my garage. Well, yeah, that makes for good decoration. You know what <laughs> I mean? Do. Out in the garage. They do. Out in the garage. Yeah. It makes it yeah. seem like you have a biker garage and you have a bunch of seats hanging on the seats wall. Seats hanging. <laughs> Goes the, the set... same for the intake covers, though, oh, yeah. too. Yeah. The I mean, I've got mine is... down here on the floor. Someone suggested to turn it into a clock. <laughs> but yeah, the sad part is the amount of research and development the OEMs put into stock exhaust yeah. to yeah. keep them compliant and stuff. It is, yeah, I mean, well, and they, they have to, right? So yeah, they really well, do. But pa- you know. Patrick and I live live in the last two states in the union that are going to give a shit about EPA compliance. I mean, <laughs> we're going to be able to have we're going to be able to shoot flamethrowers out of the back of our pipes. I mean, you're still clubbing care. baby seals up there where you are, man. We are, right? we are, we <laughs> are. We are. I mean, I think the rest of the country stopped smoking uh, in bars in 1985, and we didn't start it. We didn't stop smoking in bars till 2007 or something. <laughs> Yeah. So, Patrick, I've got a question for you while you're talking about uh, when we're talking about all this and the the uh, exhaust and everything, the the new kind of push on EPA compliance. What are what are you seeing in the the tuner area? I know Techno Research has pulled out, um, and I've heard a lot of the pipe manufacturers are, are going to uh, having cats in all the pipes. Yeah. So you're going to see. Again, SNS was kind of first with this, but part of the reason they were first with this is SNS has an emissions lab on site. Um, they have for a long, long time, and they actually do a lot of emissions work for a ton of companies, you know, besides themselves, including OEMs. Uh, so they were kind of first with this, but a few years back, they kind of pioneered it and they started making compliant product first. So you'll see them come out with a new pipe. It'll be 50 state compliant, and then they'll come out with a race version of that pipe. Um, so recently, um, Vance and Hines, you'll start to, and we just did a video on this. It's, I think it's out now. They just re- basically re-released all of their exhaust uh, with what they're calling PCX technology, power chamber exhaust. And what that means is there's a cat in everything. So even stuff like just twin slash mufflers, right? Like the twin slash muffler, they've been around forever. One of their best selling products. Well, they got cats in them now too. Um, so these, they're gonna, everybody's gonna start leaning towards compliance and it's the wild west. So part of the problem with trying to become 50 state compliant, i.e. carb, is that takes a while. So right now they're making all this PCX stuff and it's only 49 state. Now they'll get, I would imagine they'll get 50 state on that, but also there's not a lot of direction, right? Like it's, it's a little bit of guesswork on the company's part. So you're gonna see, um, Probably, I think, uh, from some companies, you're going to see both. You're going to see compliant and non-compliant stuff. Some companies are just going to go straight compliance all the way. I guess on the exhaust side, that's kind of already happened in the automotive world. And you can make power with cat pipes, with 50-state compliant pipes. It just means you got you need a more expensive cat. But they, the catalytic converters, the, there are cats that will make power and make power on big motors. 
where the tricky part and what I'm waiting to see is what happens, like you mentioned, on the tuning side. That's right. Right. But but again, the automotive world is I mean, I don't know how much of the automotive stuff you guys follow. I kind of follow a lot of hot rod stuff. There's all kinds of tuners out there. Like Holly EFI is huge, huge, huge. You can get one off, full one off systems um, from them. And I mean, like, do you guys watch any of the um, the street race stuff on Discovery? The yeah, the, 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 all those guys use one off fuel injection systems. So I think we'll get there. I think what it'll be is you'll see a lot of like the the general population stuff be compliant, much like FP4. Right. Um, I think Power Commander Six says it'll only allow 15% one way or the other, but I think there's a workaround to that. I think you can actually use other maps that'll work with it that are more than 15% either way. You're going to see a move in that direction, but if if the automotive industry is any indicator, I think there'll be product available. Um, I don't know, man, I don't know how you police that, saying, oh, it's race only. I'm only, I'm only going to race right. this. You know what I mean? Like, well, I know the diesel side on the automotive uh, side has uh, been hit really hard. Yep. And uh, they and there there are states moving to do something about that in the you know with the the diesel on the I mean I've heard one or two states you can't resell your vehicle they won't they won't take it if it's yeah been, if it's been flashed and like you know like you know uh, Ryan was saying it is I think a lot of it will be state by state like you know where we're at I would be shocked if they're like okay we need to smog your car before you can re-register it but in you know California Arizona the Northeast you know. There are a lot of places where you have to have your car, you know, smog checked when you right. register it or every so many years. So, well, you guys are punished so much already just living up there. I mean, why would they put any unnecessary regulations on top of that? They don't even nah, make us I love wear helmets. I mean, they don't give a shit if we live or die. So the emissions aren't even going to be a thing. Ryan, we live in America. I know. Oh, exactly. is that what it is? Exactly. <laughs> I think you live in fucking Canada. <laughs> he damn near does. He's almost I, I almost do, but it's still on this side of the border. So I have a lot yeah. of freedoms. You guys yeah. don't. You guys don't have. Yeah, I think you'll see it. So it'll be. A, I, I think like you know, there'll probably be a lot of a state by state, but uh, you know how it goes. But I mean, the companies really got to kind of walk on eggshells, and a lot of companies have been fined. Uh, you just don't know about it. They've paid the fines over the last right. few years. Right. So, I mean, and again, it's the one thing I will say is uh, I think CARB is kind of a crock of shit in that the last time I checked, now things that could, could have changed. They are self funded, meaning if they don't levy fines, they don't get funding. Yep, there you go. So they're incentivized to levy fines. So, and, what do you think this is going to do to uh, like a thrash and supply or an HPI or these these kind of mom and pop, you know, companies that are that are making, um, you know, making some really good exhaust, but haven't necessarily done anything with carb compliance? Do you think that they're going to become compliant or are they just going to say, fuck you and and not worry about it because they're small enough that maybe a boutique size, they're not going to be they're not going to be uh, for all the out. attention. Yeah. If I had to guess, I think the, they're small enough that they're not going to be a target. Here's the other thing about compliance. It costs money, um, not just to redevelop your product and put a cat in it, but then you have to there, – there's not very many um, labs in the States, right? So a guy – you know, somebody like Thrashen, they would have to build their product, put the cat in it, send it to SNS, pay SNS to, you know, test it to make sure it's compliant. If it wasn't, well, then back to square one, we do it again. You know what I mean? So, well, it and Thrashen's in California, so they might already be compliant, to be honest. I mean, no, compared there's to nothing HBI, in that fucking pipe. I don't think there's so, nothing yeah. in there. No, there's nothing not in that I've pipe. seen. Oh, okay. But I would, I would imagine they're probably like, you know, there's a small and boutique enough that sure. they're probably not high on the, on the radar of the, sure. of the entities. Right. It's weird, Cause right? Because all of us... those one offs that you, that you're talking about, those, all those new stainless exhausts you see yeah, pop I mean, up everywhere. Yeah, there's a lot of people out there with vision exhaust. I mean, so Wiki Speed and Fab Twenty Eight. Yep. You know, there's a lot of guys selling real cool stuff out there. But I, you know, it's the like I said, it's the Wild West, and there is a lot of question of, of how it's going. And, and it has to do with administrations too, right? Like the previous administration basically just I don't want to say they didn't shut off carbon compliance, but they didn't pay as much attention to it. So I think it's going to ebb and flow. Some's going to come down to the state level, 
And then I think it will sort itself out. There's always going to be hot rod stuff. I think there's always going to be a way to tune something. But you just need to do your due diligence and know what you're buying and the capability of what that is. I think especially on the tuner side, I have confidence in the exhaust companies to make make compliant exhaust that will make power. I think the trick is going to be on the tuning side. Yep, I would agree. And you could always go with the philosophy, try to catch me, Ranger Rick. Yeah, Yeah, I just finished a stage two on my uh, 21 Roguelide special and grabbed one of the last uh, licenses from Techno Research because you you can't get those tuners anymore. I mean, hey, let's just put carburetors back on everything. Mm. (laughs) There you go. Yeah, really. Then you don't have to worry about a tuner, man. I mean, if the fuel injection works so good, it's that's the that's the you know tough part. Yeah, the problem, Tony, with with me is that uh, Ranger Rick can see me fifty miles away, so you know. <laughs> well, and he can hear you too. That yeah. fucking well, bike of yours is obnoxious. He can't. I woke you up need all a my neighbors or yesterday. something in that fucker. Yeah. I just I, I got I got out for the first time yesterday, Patrick. After this stupid ass winter we've been having, mm-hmm. and I uh, I made sure to make a couple blocks around the neighborhood to remind everybody that I lived here. So <laughs> I bet they appreciate I you they a great forgot. deal. The you're fuck offs of- are coming. The fuck offs are coming. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you were out of hibernation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm one of the. I'm the only. I shouldn't say the only one of the only pr- people in the neighborhood, and certainly uh, the only one that has a bike as loud as mine. And it wasn't the intention. I didn't. I didn't do the things with my bike to be loud, but after I put the cam in there, it got out of control. Well, you're damn sure, and, you, you, know, sure you enjoy it. You, you make sure everybody else knows what you did to your bike. We all know well, you mean, like attention, Ryan. It's not it's my okay. problem. You the rest of you guys are pussies. It. That's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> I did not, have, to, I did not have tinnitus. I did not have tinnitus until I rode behind you after you did that upgrade. <laughs> what's that? Uranus. Fucked up my ears. What's that, Dave? All I hear is a ringing. What? what what's that? <laughs> what? Yeah, <I> hear <laughs> It, Dave's ears took a pounding in Uranus. Yeah, I'll tell you sure what, did. you ride yeah, behind me, you'll know all about emissions by the time you get back to the house. Patrick, if you don't if you don't know, last year we, we do a we do a meetup and event every year for the people um, that listen to our podcast and, and last year we did our meetup in Uranus, Missouri. So you can oh, about wow, imagine with the name with the name like Five Dirty Bikers Podcast and we doing a meetup in Uranus, Missouri. It was literally twelve months of, of ass jokes. So, oh, five dirty bikers in your anus. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, how many yeah. people can you fit in your anus? I mean, it's and just you know what is the list went on. And worth on. It. As good as we thought we were, they were a lot better there at it. <laughs> oh, yeah. they're pros. We were. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're they're pros in your anus. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> they were. They, were. <laughs> they made a lot of room. <laughs> they they really knew how to work your anus. I can tell you that <laughs> for yeah. sure. So Patrick, so, I've got a question here. You mm-hmm. guys were acquired by uh, Komodo Holdings yeah. back in twenty. Mm-hmm. I think it was like February of twenty. Yep. Did you guys see any sort of big changes company wise? Anything from cultural to the way you guys operate, or was it just business as usual? I mean, from where I'm standing, business as usual. Other than like, like I said, it was a great. I mean, it was awesome for us on the video side because of that was their strong suit. I think where you we seen the biggest changes, honestly, it was also on the store side. So there's like 160 cycle gears or something like that. Mm-hmm. And so they are you obviously know how to run a retail, you know, motorcycle store. And we had the Daytona location, obviously, the Anamosa location, and here in Sturgis at this location, but they immediately like, oh no, you, we need more stores. The, the plan was to expand. So now we have JPS Taylor, Michigan, we have Pigeon Forge in Tennessee. And then we have Scottsdale, Arizona. So that was one of the first things where they're like, we, you, we need to have more retail, which is great. I mean, it's good for everybody. So I think that part of it had a big effect. Otherwise, I mean, there, there wasn't really, I mean, much as far as like how busy, you know, we were, J and P had been, you know, part of a big corporation for a long time. So it wasn't like we went from, mom and pop organization to this big company. We had been owned by LDI. We've been owned by, by mag. We were used to dealing with being part of a big corporation. So, I mean, they're your normal, like kind of getting to know you type of internal growing pains as far as like who does this or who, you know, uh, like the IT department instead of, you know, they become part of one big IT department, right? So like internal things like that changed. But as far as like who we are, they really wanted us to stay who we are and be who we are. 
which I think is great. And they're like, you know, they we, we really wanted, you know, JP was built on kind of like technical prowess, right? Like you can walk into a JP, go back, talk to that dude. And he was a guy who rode a bike, knew what you were talking about. And they really wanted to lean on that and say, hey, this is who we are. We're, we're people that ride motorcycles and work on motorcycles, which isn't what the other companies were kind of built on. You know what I mean? So they were very adamant about like kind of not, you know, definitely not changing that and leaning into it, which I really appreciated. Yeah. So I, I don't know if you know this or not, but it, the online inventory between all three companies, Cycle Gear, JMP, and RevZilla, is it the same? Because I've noticed like if I'm looking for something and RevZilla's out, it seems like you're out and Cycle Gear's out also. It'll be the same, yeah. Well, so there's some things that aren't going to cross over, right? Like you're going to see some stuff on um, RevZilla you won't see on JMP. And some th see, see things on JMP you won't see on RevZilla that is like, you know, what's the i'm trying to think of it it's okay like uh, um uh dianese road race suit you're not going to see that on jmp cycles right no. you're not going to see shovel head parts on rosella so in that aspect it's not the same but as far as if there is yeah you're looking at inventory of something and it's out on jmp it's going to be out on rosella also because we have a couple of giant warehouses that we share to ship out of no, so there's some things so that like are if like you're like looking at a helmet you know it'd be out of stock in all three yes. then. That's okay. Correct. Yep. It's kind of what I thought. I, I think you all have a where I'm in Louisville, Kentucky, and I know you all ship out of here. You got a real big one there. That's yeah, I was gonna <laughs> say. I was every time I like the first time I paid for like this overnight shipping because I needed the part really bad, and I was like, the fucker came from three blocks down the street. Yes. <laughs> so I was like, I didn't have to pay for that. Don't throw it over the fence. <laughs> yeah. Well, we probably got some Discord questions for Patrick, so we'll get to those. All right. Sure. So, Patrick, we have a, a Discord that's connected to our podcast with over 700 members in it. And uh, we, when we know we're going to have a guest on or we know who's coming up next week, we'll, we'll put it out there and say, hey, do you have any questions for this, for this person? And so that's what we did last week when we, when we confirmed that you were going to be on. And so we have people that uh, just had some questions for you. So yeah, that's, that's what it is. I can't wait. Mm -hmm. You guys want to know? You probably already is? answered most. What's of that? Them. You guys want to know who my barber is? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Since you brought it up, because uh, I wasn't going to say anything, because I'm the nice, kind member of the podcast group here. <laughs> um, you were OTB. talking about ARP. ARP. <laughs> You were talking about all that nitrous and stuff. Yeah. Um, is, does does that is that what happened to the hair? You left your yeah. hair back when. Uh, yeah, I just it's it's it was just fear. It it left out of fear. <laughs> I thought it was, I thought it was friction weird. from the speed. I'll yeah. tell you what happened to mine. It choked itself out. It was too yeah. fucking thick. Yeah. So all you people with thick hair, good luck. Uh, uh, my, my, thanks, bro. Mine just got scared and jumped ship. Yeah. Mine did too. Mine, to, Tony's fell right onto my back. back. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, that's uh yeah. I, I don't know if so. This is a little tangent. So back in the day. Man, when was this? It had to be like 2007, maybe. No, it was after that. 2010, maybe. You guys familiar? Baker used to do burnout drags. Okay. So they used to do them in Sturgis. I think they brought them back. You actually had a tree, like a drag race tee, but you were fixed into place. And you would start, They would. the tree would come down, you would start doing a burnout, and you had to shift through the gears. First one to fifth gear, fifth or sixth gear would win. And so they asked me, Bert, Bert Baker's great company, by the way. Did you I mean, win a new transmission after that? You did, actually. You did. <laughs> I mean, yeah, honestly, you did. So he's like, hey, do you want to do burnout drags here in Sturgis? I go, oh, sure, no problem. I was like, what's the deal? He goes, well, honestly, these guys take it too serious every year. He goes, you know, just, just have fun. So I ordered a gorilla costume off of Amazon. There's footage and pictures of this. And I took a, I took a hot rod sportster that we had. And I had a full gorilla costume and I competed in the gorilla costume and destroyed everybody uh, <laughs> in the whole event wearing a gorilla costume. And so at the end, it was down at the Iron Horse Saloon here at the down on the other end of town. And at the end, I took off the, the mask and I said, yeah, you know, I'm, I look the same underneath so I can relate. <laughs> I'm basically a gorilla costume underneath of this. T-shirt. <laughs> so did, I, I'm sure, you know, you, when you go in there and you're trying to take it all seriously, then you get your ass whipped by a giant monkey. You're like, fuck. That, that was the point. So there was a lot of builders who will remain, remain nameless uh, in that competition with big, large 
engines on really cool bikes. And I rolled up on a uh, Sportster with about 80 PSI in the rear tire and, <laughs> and, just, <laughs> and proceeded to just blow through all the gears because that tire was like, this was very, very hard. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So it was a good time. Uh, Baker burnout drags. If they have them, definitely check them out. It's, it's party. All right. So here's the first question from 2019 FLHT Kyle. Poo. God damn. Mm. That's a question, that's a for Pat- question for Patrick. What are the best off-road tires for a KTM Duke 690? Oh, so I owned a uh, 690 Supermoto a couple years ago. So the best off-road tire. So if he's got a, if he's got a Duke, man, he's got a Duke 690. So it's a street bike. The best way to do that, honestly, probably throw some TKC 80s on there, Continental TKC 80s, because um, they make them in 17s, which he probably, if he's got a Duke, he's got dual 17s on that bike. And the thing about a TKC 80, here, actually, there's one right here. That's a TKC 80 on the front of that. Uh, it's an off-road tire, but they actually work really well on the street. They don't last a long time. They're a softer rubber. So that that knobby tire actually dri- grips really good on the street and works really good in the dirt, and they make those in 17s. So if he has a Duke 690, He's got 17s on him. He'll have to probably go that direction. How many miles can you get out of that, you think? Depends how you ride it. Uh, I had a TKC80 on my KTM last year, and I got about 4,000 off out of the rear. But that's okay. riding very aggressively off-road, and it's really rocky out here, so it just chews those tires up off-road. So- that'd, be three, that'd be three seasons for you, Tony. Yeah, I was going to say, that's a lifetime. <laughs> I'd trade the fucking bike by then. <laughs> Too dirty. Yep. Okay, J Money Thirty Three asks: Since being acquired by the parent company of Revzilla, are the inventories of the brands completely separate? We we went. We over just this answered that. Yep. Yep. There's been times I look for parts on both sides. Both were sold out. Just wondering if it was a coincidence or not. But yeah, we covered that, so yep. we could probably yep. go ahead and move on. So J Money, we answered you earlier on the podcast, dude. Yeah. Belated binge podcast. I didn't see this one. Welcome. How do they Is go about... Is it a about... long fucking question? It's 40, <laughs> at 47 pots. Oh, my God. <laughs> no. Just for you. How do, how do they go about making partnerships with brands to sell? For example, a podcast favorite, Rurock. If Fuck want... Rurock. <laughs> <laughs> Answers that question. Fucking things, man. A podcast favorite, Rurock. If they wanted to start selling their helmets, how would they go about that? I so you have to get in... Yeah, get in contact with them with our merch department, and basically, yeah, I hate to speak for those guys, but if it's something they're interested in selling, then it would come down to you know they you know negotiate margin numbers with them. If the margin numbers meet what you know everybody's happy with on both sides, there are other factors that come into it. Like you know, I mean, inventory levels. Could we get the stuff when we needed it? Like one of the worst things you can do as like a parts company, and we've touched on already a couple times is not have stuff that people want to buy right and that's one of the big tricks i mean any really kind of parts company of any kind we're they're they're really a logistics company and it's a balance of like how much inventory how much money are you willing to lay out to have inventory to sell it's a balance i mean ideally you want to sell it as quick as you bring it in you want to sell it you know i think somebody said there was a statistic with amazon a long time ago they turn inventory so fast that they actually make money on the, the money they're holding. So the trick is to not sit on inventory for a long time and be able to buy smart and have the right stuff and get it out the door as quickly as possible. That's why you're always going to see like that kind of fluctuation. So that's a big thing too, is like how fast can the supplier get us something that we need? Are they going to have it? Are we going to, we you definitely don't want to have people on back order. So there's a couple of decisions other than like, is it just a cool part to sell? Um, can everybody make money and can we get to the customer in, in a, you know, a quick, quick amount of time? Yeah. Cause just like that HPI stuff right now, what is it? If you ordered, it's 20 weeks to get your exhaust. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, that's wow. fucking crazy, man. Wow. Yeah. And I think this could probably go as a question for this show too, because we have a couple sponsors. We have Memphis shades and wild ass. It was just pretty much, I know for Memphis shades, a few of us were, already sponsored by them through our YouTube channels. And it was just a matter of asking. I mean, I had a small channel yeah. whenever we, we were going through um, windshields and stuff like that. And they were just so eager to help out even a small channel like, like me at the time. So it's just like we've said before, I mean, the worst thing they could say is no, just ask, send an email, send a 
send yep. a DM through Instagram or whatever social you have. Jay Sherman. Jay Sherman. Bill, His bike you... breaks down every year. <laughs> Ryan every leaves year behind. without every I leave year. that dude behind. I'm not waiting yeah. for that motherfucker. His no. bike's going to break every time. <laughs> Breaks down every fucking year. <laughs> yep. Jay asks, will you be having the annual event in Anamosa this year? Please bring the warehouse back to Anamosa. I, I wish. So I, I, are you guys familiar with the old JP Cycles open house? No, sir. So when we only, when the headquarters was there, we had a 135,000 square warehouse. And basically we would do open house every year. It started off as a one day event and moved to a two day event. And we'd, get about 35,000 people in two days. Wow. And pretty much every, we have over a hundred vendors every year, every semi you can think of, you know, SNS, Vance and Hines, you know, Memphis Shades, like everybody was at open, all of our vendors are open house. And we, the great part was we had all the inventory there. So we had a warehouse full of inventory. So basically if you showed up, you're probably going to be able to buy whatever you wanted or see it. That was the other part. Like it's tough oh, to buy wow. some of this stuff, right? Like, even like a, a seat that's a good you, you want to look at it it's tough to buy online so you would go to open house and all this stuff would be there and it was a all hands on deck type of deal for jmp we had about 280 300 employees at the time and everybody worked all day both days it was non-stop took us a couple of weeks to set up for basically and not only that we would feed everybody for free oh, we had wow. a we had a food tent and uh hamburgers hot dogs drinks chips all free um, we had a stunt show every year. It was huge. It was a great, it was a great time. But unfortunately, like I said, that warehouse is now in Louisville. The store is still there. So the op that open house event is unfortunately no longer there. I, it really bums me out, but that's, that's the, the sad truth. Okay. Well, there you go. There's your answer to that. So Jay. yeah, Jay, no. So no free hot dogs for you. Jay. No free hot no dogs free hot for hot you. Dog. No yeah. free wieners. And you got to pay for them. Hopefully your bike doesn't break down on the way there. <laughs> I won't know because I won't That's be That's brutal. <laughs> right, to be gone. I'll be gone. <laughs> so, Iron Horse and Greg. Speaking of the Iron Horse, we spoke of earlier. Ask him his favorite coffee spots in the Black Hills, <laughs> so I know where to take Percy, and so the portion of the discussion will get Kid Moto all worked up. Fuck coffee. <laughs> oh man, I'm a coffee guy. Yeah, I like coffee uh, too. Oh, but high five, all these, all these, all, <laughs> no, all no, these Patrick. old bastards. All these old bastards talk about taking road <laughs> trips to Starbucks and get <laughs> <laughs> Starbucks. Starbucks isn't is coffee. The ladies like my spot is Sturgis Coffee. Like every, literally every morning, I go to Sturgis Coffee. Um, well, I mean, there's a cutoff time though. Like anytime past 10 a.m., it's beer 30. I, I drink a cup of coffee and go to sleep. Uh, I, I drink coffee <laughs> up until you drink coffee I mean, and go to sleep. Yeah, I love coffee. It's uh, so Sturgis Coffee. I can't uh, – Anna and her crew of ladies down there, they are awesome, man. Um, Sturgis Coffee is the – if you come to Sturgis for the rally, make sure you go get some coffee at Sturgis Coffee. They're, they're great people, and they're great locals. I definitely have to check that out. I'll leave your ass there too, Dave. Not to worry. <laughs> oh, hey, oh, hey. Something is, no, they sell beer also at Sturgis Coffee. Nice. Perfect. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, there, there's actually a, a, like a, a cafe uh, in Whitewood. Mm -hmm. That looks oh, really yeah. interesting. Oh, uh, damn it. I forgot the name of it. I, they have good coffee. And, yep. uh, yeah, there I, you go. I, yep. Well, I'm definitely hitting that up. Brian just up wants a cup of Sanka. Call it a day. I mean, Sanka. Jesus. Give me some taster's let's, choice. Let's not make this complicated. <laughs> If it if it's if there's dried, more syllables, shit. it takes more syllables than black. Fucking freeze dried shit, man. If it takes more syllables than black coffee, I don't want to drink it. That yeah. just sounds like a Caverna sounds like Coffee and Bistro. So, you, yeah, that's so, the one. There's a place in Keystone also that is uh, it's coffee and gelato, which I, oh, I love nice. ice cream and coffee. Oh. I think they do wine there too. But right in Keystone. Uh, across from like that big slide and zip line and stuff is right next to the wax museum. There's a good uh, coffee and gelato place. And dude, Lone Ryan, fuck the poker run, dude. You and I are going to be doing the coffee run. Can you get, can you get gelato in your coffee? I mean, you just <laughs> take not? it and put it in. <laughs> Keep it up and get gelato up your ass. That's what yeah. uh, Listen, there's no reason to get mean here. AARP. <laughs> there's, yeah, I'm, I'm a coffee at downtown rap and Harriet and Oak. 
Harriet and Oak is another great coffee spot downtown oh, wow. Rapids. Yep. This guy knows them all. Dude, I'm, gonna, to do them all I'm, man. I'm calling you in June when we get or July. Yeah, we, we can do, we'll do a coffee tour, man. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm getting up there like three days before Ryan, so you know that'll yeah. work. Well, I'm I'm going up there in June, so I'm gonna go find Patrick in June. Yeah, so. yeah definitely. <laughs> Jesus, you're gonna have the shakes. You look like Michael J. Fox. Yeah. We'll be jacked <laughs> to the gills on coffee. Dude, that's, so that's, I that's tried. Wrong, this is, <laughs> it is because he's, my, wrong, favorite. he's my favorite. He's my favorite of all time. I really like that. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is what this is what I tried explaining to everybody is that is that this is the thing. I like coffee. I drink coffee every day before work. But this is I don't necessarily know from day to day what coffee's gonna do to me. What I'm not a fan of is shitting myself on my I'm butt. Say you your pants. Yeah. yeah, so I don't want to just go to coffee and then have to think to myself the whole time, is this going to be the day that I shit myself on my butt? You know, so, that would be terrible because you could have like that renegade fart, man. You well, know, it just goes bad. Yeah. You're on your bike and you, you got different pressure points on your bike than you do in your car. And yeah. you could just shoot right out of the bottom of your pant legs. And it's the Dude. last thing I want. But you, but you need to worry you, about okay. more than just coffee if that happens. <laughs> yeah, if you're uh, if you're out and about out in the boonies, and the only place you're going to be able to stop is the poker butt truck stop. You see him coming back out of the woods with one shirt sleeve. That's <laughs> right. Bill socks. That's right. What happened to your socks? What? What happened, what happened to the sleeve of your Dixon? <laughs> I don't ever wear shirts. I thought you guys knew that. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, All right, that went sideways. What 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 else we got? <laughs> PA PA Diner Rider asks Diner Rider. Question for Patrick. Say someone is trying to ball on a budget, but still wants expensive name brand items. Do you guys sell any blemished items? Example like seats that have stitching that is not straight or missed a stitch, labels messed up on items, a nick on a finished product, etc. Oh, I know Rev, I know about, I know Revzilla's done that. He's talking about motorcycle parts. That, yeah. That's not yeah. where I thought he was going with that, wanting so the ball on a budget. We do. Uh unfortunately, like JP out of old school JMP people remember at events, we always just have clearance tents. Mm-hmm. We don't do that anymore, but you just gotta be sharp online. And so here's one way that blem items happen. If they if I do a video on something, let's say an exhaust, if I do it, normally people want to hear what it sounds like. So I have to install it. Like we just did. Uh, coming out this weekend is our best of exhaust video. So I think I installed like, I don't know, 13 exhausts or something like that. Those can't be sold as new. I'm not going to leave all those exhausts piled around in here. So those will be sold as like used or blemmed items. But you just kind of got to either be on it, check back, or when you when you look at them, there'll be another SKU available. Like you said, you see it on Revzilla. There'll be like a SKU for a pipe, and there'll be another one that's less. It's because it's a blem. So we, we do that. And a lot of times it's actually video stuff. It's video product. Those are helpful videos too. It's like the great exhaust sound off video. I've seen I've seen a few of them yeah. online, and it really helps people kind of decide what they want because exhaust can be they can be tricky. Yeah, that's the another one. It's tricky. hard to buy online. Yeah. So speaking of that, I got I, this is way off the wall. But when you when people like Fuel Moto when they dyno when they they use one bike for all that and just change exhaust and parts on it. A lot of times they will do that. Um, so he did a great article a couple years ago about cams. Mm-hmm. And I believe he just went through and just changed that cam on that bike a bunch of times. Um, that's the best way to do it as far as like getting a comparison. But obviously, if you know, you're know you doing it months apart, you may use a different bike. Yeah, I just didn't know if they had like yep. one bike because I was like, boy, at the end of that fucking two or three years, that bike has to seen yeah. some lot of action. Oh, like well, the bike that I that I built, the uh, we did the so that it's a it's a fat bob or a, we call it Fat Billy. Uh, it's a fat, yeah, it's, the the fat bob, yeah, yeah. So, and we did a video and like from the crankshaft to the top of that bike, building that motor. But before that, I think I had like thirteen different exhausts we put on that bike or something like that for different videos. So it it was a mule, man. It was an install mule, and eventually, you know, like I do with everything, I just put a giant ass motor in it. Just put a you sure yeah. in the hell did too, boy. You didn't, you guys didn't jack around. So, do you have creative all the rights to that, or do they tell you what what they want you to do? Generally, that's so we have production meetings, but most of the time, uh, that we'll get a request, let's say, from merch and say, Hey, we have this pipe, we want you to do a video on it because we're selling a lot of them or we want to sell a lot of them. Those, those requests come through, but on the builds that's pretty much me or especially if it just comes with like a general idea but that particular one was 
was me. I was like, hey, we've you know, we've done you know a cam video. I wanted to do something that was com- that was complete. So anybody that ever wanted to do anything to an M8 could could do it. And we did that. We have crankshaft videos, cam videos, big board videos, cylinder head videos. You know, um, I did a primary side video. So that one was me because I wanted to do stem to stern M8 stuff. Yeah, no, you guys made that M8 your bitch for sure. Yeah, it was fun. That bike fucking hauls ass, man. <laughs> All right. We'll do a few more, then uh, we can probably wrap up here okay. soon with Patrick. Uh, let's see. We'll do one from Moto Mortician that kind of goes with a question that our friend Volts also asked. With unlimited resources, what bike would you build out? Um, man, it's it got, I guess it's what I would depends what I want to do. Um, some of the stuff, so like a lot of on the dirt side of things, it's not like a Harley, right? Like the, a lot of the dirt bikes. A lot of the adventure bikes that I ride, they're really, really good from the factory. So I'm not changing a lot of stuff on them. But I've man, I've really had a hanker in here lately to build um, a, a turbo M8 or a really, really big nitrous uh, M8 bike. And just spoiler alert: at the end of the year, I may be doing another M- a larger uh, M8 build than the previous one. Uh, I probably won't do a power rider to it, but if I had an unlimited budget, I would probably try to push, see how far. I know there are guys out there on the on a lot of the, the bagger stuff that's being drag raced that are you know in the 300 horsepower range. Um, I would probably build a real monster M8, prop, maybe not a bagger. I'd probably stick to a soft tail platform again just to save some weight, but I wouldn't mind doing a turbo M8 build. Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Fuck. We'll do one more here, and it's from Uncle Vic. Other than the current performance Harley trend, do you see any current or upcoming trends? Do you see any growth in aftermarket parts for br- other brands than Harley, like Indian and Suzuki? Man, fuck Indian. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care about those. Um, I, so Indian is going to be a limited. So I've done a fair amount with, with Indians. Um I don't think so. Here's something that a lot of people don't really take into consideration when it comes to aftermarket parts is unit sales numbers. So if a manufacturer is going to make a part, they're going to make the part that has the most units out there. Right. So like if I'm going to make an exhaust pipe, I want to make an exhaust pipe for something I know I can sell to as many people as possible. So there's a lot more. And also Harley carries engines on for a long time. Right. So you can imagine how many possible sales you got from a twin cam bagger because those pipes fit from like 99 all the way on up right same thing with m8 you have road glides street glides ultras road kings all those parts fit that bike so that's where other brands don't quite get the aftermarket you know push afterwards or it's or it's more niche um so i i do like indian challengers they work extremely well right out of the box but if you want, if you're wanting to do modification, I know Lloyd's does a ton with them, but it's not like it's going to be much harder to do like big bores and cams and heads and stuff like that to an Indian ta- challenger than it is to a road glide because of just unit sales numbers. So I think you're, you're always going to see smaller uh, aftermarket windows for anything but Harleys. But I will say as far as the trends, I see the performance one sticking. It's been around for a while. I think it's going to stick around for a while, which is great because I love functionality in motorcycles. I will say it, a lot of ways, the performance bagger thing to me is a lot like the big wheel bagger thing in that it's a trend and guys are just bolting stuff on bikes. It just looks different. They're spending they're spending $7,000 on wheels that are 17s instead of 30s <laughs> just because that's the trend. The good that part is you can- big wheel bagger act- thing was terrible. It was terrible. <laughs> it was terrible. But I will say this, choppers never die. They do not. They do not. Speaking of Chopper, everybody, make sure, and if you don't know, go buy tickets for our raffle bike that we have over at 5DirtyBikers.com. It's a beautiful 75 Ironhead Sportster built by Jared Weems, donated by so many companies like S&S, Blockhead. Uh, List goes on. Tickets for Customs, TC Brothers. Great group of sponsors and uh, so many people that have given their time and 
so many other things to this bike to make it a reality for us. Get out there and buy some tickets, 5 com, and help out the autism community, a uh, community that could really use it. And I'm I'm keeping it warm for you. I'm, I'm riding it. Until you, you... <laughs> Motherfucker. <laughs> Making sure the battery doesn't die. Huh? Making sure not. the battery doesn't die in the car. <laughs> you are not. Dude, you, it, there's no way you would risk getting one speck of dirt on that. No, thing. That's that's why why I, I shined it up and covered it up, man. That's why his right. blood pressure got so good. high because he's got that in his garage. <laughs> that bike is wrapped up in happened. saran wrap already. Yeah, it's got man. eight coats of bug slide on it. <laughs> Fucker hasn't moved since I left Louisville a couple of weeks ago. That some bitches, it's got a high shine on it. I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, that's good. That's the way we want it. Dude, All right. Good. Well, Patrick, it was it was it was an awesome show. Thank you for giving us the time, and uh, good luck to you and, and what you've been doing and uh, in the future. And hopefully, we keep in touch. Maybe we could do this again yeah, sometime. For sure, I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for the time. Thanks for having me. When you guys uh, come to Sturgis, um, I'm t- you know Tony, you hit me up on Instagram. That's the easy way yep. to get a hold of me. So. Um, yeah, I'm I'm norm I'm normally around here, so yeah, let's go for a ride or something. Especially if you come yeah. in June, let's not ride during the rally because that's uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm I'm coming out in June, so I'll hit you up. I'll hit you up, Patrick. Yep. Great. So Perfect. everybody, get out there and follow JMP Cycles. Uh, tell tell Patrick that Five Dirty Biker said hi, so he knows that we sent you guys over to him. Uh, get out there, watch the videos if you want to know how to wrench on your bike on your own in your garage. You heard Patrick say himself that that's where he got his start. And that's his intent on making his videos. So if you watch a video and you see that his intent is really there to help you as a, as a garage builder, as a garage renter, so you can take your bike, bike apart and fuck it up all you want. Well, I can tell you this. When I started wrenching, I had a full head of hair. <laughs> yeah. 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 There it was is. Bored. <laughs> That's what happens when you rent. Yeah. And if you're in the Sturgis area and need recommendations for a great place to get a cup of Java, Go reach out Ryan. to Ryan. <laughs> Fuck you, Dave, and your coffee. <laughs> All right, everybody. We'll talk to you next week. Until then, keep it dirty.